All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Johnson County Community College and the Craig Auditorium. My name is Sean Eady. I am an adjunct associate professor in the English and Journalism Department. And today we're talking about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. We have four experts here today. Um, we're very grateful that they've decided to come with us and spend some time. Let me introduce them to you from left to right. Um, on the far left is Dr. Luann Wolfgram. She's professor and chair of biotechnology here at Johnson County Community College. And uh, her PhD is from Johns Hopkins University, which if you've read the book, uh, plays an integral role. Uh, so we're very anxious to hear what she has to say. Uh, next over we have Dr. Lori Gauron. She's an OBGYN and a clinical instructor at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. The third one over here is uh, Professor Deb Williams. She's an associate professor of environmental science, biology, and bioethics here at JCCC. And then on the far right, we have Professor Noreen Thompson, a clinical nursing specialist and a clinical instructor at KU Med. So welcome, panelists, and thank you for, for spending your time with us this morning. Um, I would like to, to start by asking some general questions of, of the panelists. and. Um, I, my goal is to hopefully have some time at the end for questions and answers from you guys. So please, if there's something that we don't cover that you would like to hear about, um, don't hesitate to let me know. And, and I'll try and get the microphone up to you because we are recording this and it would be nice if everybody could be heard, okay? Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you do have to leave, because I know some of you uh, have classes at 11 o'clock or other commitments, if you would be so kind as to exit from the top, which will take you to the third floor of GEB, and then also I will lead by example and silence my phone. All right, Dr. Wolfgram, thank you for coming, and the, the first question is for you. Um, since you have experience at Johns Hopkins University, would you tell us maybe a two-part thing? Tell us about HeLa cells, why they're important, and then what you know about them from your time at Hopkins. Um, they've been extremely important. Um, if you've read the book, you know they were isolated in the early 50s, and um, in the early 50s, there were, we were just beginning to delve into tissue culture. They had been using animal cells, obviously, all along, and um, the problem is they'd never been able to be successful with a human cell um, line, or establishing a human cell line. And obviously, when, when researchers are trying to study human disease, the human uh, model is always the best to work in. Um, but you're not going to necessarily say, would you mind us if we infected you with this fatal virus? Um, so having a cell line, and that's where viruses grow, they need to be inside of a cell as opposed to most bacteria that we can grow artific easily artificially without any other cell in the lab. They, need, they wanted, they were looking for a cell um, that they could grow in the lab and do the studies on viruses, which we had just started to, to understand. Um, we only saw viruses for the first time about 10 years before this. Um, the electron microscope had been discovered or created in 1938. So we didn't know a lot about viruses and, and, and how they work and what they do to a cell and all of that stuff. Um, so putting all these things together um, and finding that human cell that we could finally grow naturally in culture um, was, a, was a, well, a Nobel Prize winning <laughs> kind of achievement. And the excitement kept going then um, with those HeLa cells because it was four years later in 1955 when um, a physician named Jonas Salk use those very HeLa cells to grow the po first polio vaccine. And up until that time, which is more my area of expertise, that polio, va that people were dying, being crippled by polio. We don't hear about polio much anymore because you've all been vaccinated for it, thanks to Jonas Salk and, a, and another um, doctor named Sabin. Um, but without those HeLa cells, those vaccines would never have been made. So. Some of you might have died in childhood or been crippled by polio and other viruses. So that's the initial stages where um, the HeLa cells became important to us medically. Um, and then just every study that's happened from that point on, looking at what viruses do to a cell, how they interact with a cell, we now know that those HeLa cells, in fact, were infected with a virus, the HPV virus. 
human papillomavirus, which, which causes genital warts. We now have a vaccine for that so that we can prevent most cervical cancers in women and, and although a controversial vaccine, again, protecting you from, from potentially fatal diseases. So beginning with HeLa cells and the polio vaccine, those cells and, and the research and the medical advancements that have happened are just, I don't know that we can even count them. There have been problems along the way, if you know by reading the text, the book. Um, but again, you have to remember that the goal of medical research is always for the greater good. They're never, I want to just stay, they're never doing anything evil. They don't mean to hurt anybody along the way, obviously. And so, um, you know, we have to understand also the culture of the time and all of that to see what's happened. Um, when I got to Hopkins, truly that was the first time I'd ever heard the proper name of, of, of Henrietta Lacks. Um, I think before that I'd heard all the various Helen Lanes and Helen Lakes and all kinds of variations. So at least getting me to Hopkins, I finally found out the real name of the person who, who um, donated knowingly or unknowingly these cells. Um, but her, her general, whether she, again, didn't know it, but her giving of those cells has has put us decades ahead of where medical science would be without them and saved a lot of lives in the process. The polio vaccine alone, I think, is something that we shouldn't, we can't discount. Billions of people, yeah. And if, if you're not uh, inoculated to, f against the polio, if, you, if you've never received the vaccine, you're benefiting from the herd immunity. Right. right. Okay. Dr. Garan, as our gynecological expert, can you talk a little bit about Henrietta Lacks's cervical cancer. Is it garden variety? Is this something that could be repeated? So Henrietta Lacks definitely had a very aggressive type of cervical cancer. Most cervical cancer is of the type that's a squamous cell carcinoma. She had adenocarcinoma of the cervix. And so 90% of cervical cancers are squamous cell carcinoma, which are uh, easily identified early they're slow growing, and they're very treatable. And so this is what we do pap smears for in order to screen for cervical cancer. And then if we identify an abnormality on the pap smear, we can do a cervical biopsy, which Henrietta had, although she did not have a pap smear because this was not standard of practice at that point. And then we can often treat these with uh, less aggressive treatments, such as what's called a leap, or just excising the part of the cervix that, that has the cancer identified, and then watching them, because most of the time that cures the woman of the cancer. Now for women who actually have more aggressive cancers or squamous cell uh, cancers that are more advanced, we stage these cancers. And so Henrietta was diagnosed as having a stage one um, epidermoid carcinoma, which was later changed to adenocarcinoma. Both of those are really in the same class, and they're both very aggressive um, and not like the slow-growing squamous cell carcinoma, which is much more common. And so part of what's hard about <coughs> uh, Henrietta's diagnosis is the time that she was in. We really didn't know a lot about cervical cancer at that point. We didn't routinely screen with pap smears. And women often presented when they had symptoms, just like she did. She presented when she had bleeding. And usually by the time you have bleeding, you have a very aggressive cancer. Cervical cancer is often uh, and should be clinically staged, which means that you examine the patient and decide if you can feel cancer um, anywhere else in the pelvis or in the abdomen or what you see on the cervix. Whereas other cancers, um, like ovarian, are actually uh, staged in the operating room with surgery. And so from the book, I can't really tell exactly what stage Henrietta really was because they don't really talk about the rest of her staging. She, they didn't explain her exam of whether they felt anything else in her, in her cervix or felt anything else in the uterus or her lymph nodes. But what's concerning is Henrietta felt something. So she was describing this knot that she felt in her womb months before she even got pregnant with that other child who then she then carried to term. So she had a good year plus of potentially having symptoms from this. And also, there was some concern about having blood in her urine on an early her doctor's appointment that was never really worked up. So my belief is that she probably had a very advanced stage cancer much earlier on that was metastatic probably to her bladder or to her kidneys, which put her at high risk of um, having an adverse outcome. 
In the end though, her treatment at the time was the best that she was gonna get. She was lucky to live near Hopkins for a lot of reasons. First of all, they gave care to women without the resources to pay for it. She was able to get in quickly and be seen by the experts who remain the experts in the world of gynecology, to Lind and Jones. These are people who are on our textbooks still today. And so the fact that she was there, she was receiving cutting edge treatment, even though uh, the outcome would have probably been uh, the same long term because of her aggressive cancer, she got the best that she was gonna get, which was the um, local radiation to the cervix and then uh, the external radiation where she would go in afterwards and they described how her abdomen turned black at that point. Radiation now is very different from this, um, partly because we have things like CAT scans and MRIs so we can really target the radiation where we need it in the pelvis as opposed to just radiating the entire abdomen because you, can't, you didn't have the ways to look and see where the cancer was. Um, but the other thing that uh, would have been different, if she truly was stage one at this point, which means that it was just confined to the cervix, which is what they thought, she would have had a hysterectomy and then had both chemo and radiation. Chemo didn't really exist at that point. It didn't exist until we had Henry, Henrietta cells later on to do cell cultures and identify ways of treating this. But regardless, Henrietta wouldn't likely have lived today. Even if she had been uh, diagnosed somewhat earlier with this cancer, she had had a hysterectomy, she had chemo, she had radiation. Survival rates for adenocarcinoma at five years are between zero and 30%. And these women um, have a lot of um, problems from the chemo and the radiation and the surgery too, so their quality of life is really poor overall. Um, had she had squamous cell carcinoma, she would have been cured today. The cure rates are very, very high, and unless it's really advanced at the time that they diagnose it, um, and even those women have high cure rates, these women are treated effectively and go on to live a long life. I think that's one of the most common questions that my students ask. If we could take Henrietta Lacks out of 1951 and bring her to 2012, could we treat her and would she be okay? And probably not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Professor Williams. Um, the idea of the biopsy and the, the taking of the, the tumor, the, the cells from the tumor, mm -hmm. um, was not part of the uh, document that Henrietta signed. And as far as I can tell as a layperson, probably not therapeutic, not important to the treatment of the cancer. But it was done anyway. Mm -hmm. We know from the book that that was not illegal. Most of my students, and perhaps many of you that, that have read the book, seem to generally conclude that it was not right. Can you speak to whether or not that sort of situation would happen to a woman today? Well, it's, um, it, it really depends on, on what we know, and I think a lot of what we know from the textbook is probably not the complete story. I think what we do know from the textbook and what's already been, or the book, I suppose, not the textbook, although it easily could be for a subject like this, um, that there's a standard, a standard practice, a stad standard of ordinary care, and that's a term of art in the legal context that guides what we can expect under certain um, professional client uh, practices, whether that's law or medicine. And so in 1951, there was an ordinary care standard in terms of diagnostic medicine, and there is one today that, that physicians are legally and ethically bound uh, to uphold. And so what we know is that what has been referenced um, in the earlier comments is that times have changed, and that with time, progress and, and new opportunities and new understandings um, have emerged from uh, what we've gleaned from those, those earlier um, efforts and endeavors. Um, so if we assume, um, like the statement was, was posed, that the intent was to extract the material for a reason other than um, diagnostic means, I, I would have, you know, I would question that because, again, g given what was described, um, even though times have changed and understanding of medicine um, has, has advanced substantially, um, it's hard to separate a, a purposeful extractive measure from a diagnostic uh, potentially positively impacting um, impact on, on the patient itself. So you could say, well, maybe the intent was to do research and explore this, this tissue. But in that exploration, 
if there was successful uh, understanding from the research done, then that could have positively, positively impacted the patient themselves. So to say it's right or wrong, um, it has to, you have to really dive into intent, and it's difficult you know, for me from this position um, in hindsight to say that it was a sinister intent because it, it, it couldn't have been, whether it's for the purpose of advancing understanding of medicine generally or more, more likely, and it may be uh, both, in both situations, it was um, intended to advance the understanding of this particular patient in, um, it, it expl explicitly. So um, whether it's right or wrong in the sense that it was taken without her understanding, there are a lot of things that we engage in in a, a medical arena that we don't have full understanding of, and that leads to a better understanding on behalf of the physician, and then that ultimately benefits us as the patient in the long run. So I would just qualify my answer and say that I think it's easy to look at the whole picture and say there's a sense of something that isn't right about um, you know, the families that have survived her, and we can talk about that, and I'm sure we will. But what happened to her in the particular seems to be right on track with what happens in everyday practice of medicine. And <laughs> I, I seem to be getting some nods to that. Um, so I don't think we can infer or imply that there's intent that was malicious, uh, even in this situation, even in that historic time frame, which we all can acknowledge was a very different um, setting and situation than we experience today, but similar as well. Okay. Um, Professor Thompson. The idea of informed consent didn't exist in 1951. The phrase had never even been uttered. Um, can you perhaps, maybe, maybe this is a little bit of medical history, can you perhaps explain the culture of medicine that didn't contemplate the concept of informed consent, which is to say the patient's acquiescence was not considered? Right. Um, well, I think it still continues today in this particular realm. Because, as we know, when, I mean, I know myself, when you go into the hospital, you sign a consent saying that if there's tissues or whatever, that, you know, you're, you're kind of allowing them to use them as they need to, diagnostically, research, whatever, for, just for education, especially working in an academic medical center. Um, and I never thought twice about that, you know. I mean, I think it's, it's the, I think what's wonderful is that at this point in time, we're really having discussions like this. And I think that Rebecca <coughs> writing this book has really made this problem more, um, more in our consciousness, which is a good thing because um, people are starting to talk about, you know, what, what is this exactly that I'm consenting to? And maybe there'll be some policy that will come from this. Um, there was, I mean, as we know, there was the Tuskegee study um, way back and there was not um, informed consent and that that was if those of you who don't know but most of you probably do that was the natural course of syphilis with african-american men they were not told that there was penicillin they were not told that there was they were not getting what they needed and they were just observing that um, that was you know it was really horrendous and that was something that happened um, that this is a piece of, you know, in a way. This is, a, you know, something else that has happened that really impacts people of, especially people in minorities, being suspicious of our intent. But you're asking more about informed consent. I don't know that I have, like, that much background in the history of informed consent. Um, but I think as we go along, we know that we have now, you know, internal in terms of all hospitals and medical centers and academics when there's science being done we are being overseen very well by the national institute of health and people are really every study that comes through is is very stringently looked at now for you know, making sure that the vulnerable the subjects are um, informed and if it's a vulnerable population, like people with mental illness or disability, mental retardation, um, children, they are very much protected. So I would say that's really has improved tremendously. And it all happened 
kind of in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and keeps getting more and more. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are researchers, you, know, you just know you have to be very careful to, to really make sure people know what they're being asked to do or being asked to give. Let's continue on that, uh, that sort of thread because in the absence of law, what guides the practice of medicine? How does, medi does medicine police itself? And if so, how? Hmm. Well, in my life, I'm on the ethics committee at University of Kansas Hospital. I've been there for 25 years. I've been on the ethics committee for 20. And um, I think that you know, the professions with all the oaths that we take, nursing, physicians, um, you know, you take oaths to do no harm, to do good. And I believe that um, we get so many ethics call calls from physicians, from nurses, asking, are we doing the right thing? How can we make sure that we are doing the right thing, particularly for patients who can't really speak for themselves? Um, so I think some of it comes from the professions, from the code of ethics within the professions. Um, and I'd let everyone else say something. That yeah, go ahead, Dr. Wolfram. From the, and then from the research side of it, um, I've been on the Institutional Research Board at, at KU Med, and I'm on a, a, a biosafety committee now. It's the Stowers Institute. Under, people have, I think, uh, a misunderstanding of physicians and researchers. Um, a lot of people think we're Frankensteins. Um, no, we're trying to improve your life. We're trying to give your life more time and make that life better. And, you know, I, I'm absolutely sure in my brain and my heart that Dr. Gay took that sample because he thought he could do some good with it and proved that he was definitely not a, after anything because he gave the cells away. He didn't sell them, he gave them away. Um, but yeah, she mentioned the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. Any researcher that needs to use human um, materials, human subjects, have very strict rules as to how they can use it, what they can do with it, and what they have to tell the patient or the subjects in that um, uh, research project what's going on. Um, here at Johnson County Community College, we don't do a lot of high power research. We even have an institutional research board for human, to talk about human subject use, if they do something with you in your psychology class. So, you know, we're watching, we're protecting, because we're humans too. We're potential patients, subjects, whatever. And like I said, it's especially if you work at, around an institution that's a medical research place, whether it's KU Med, I worked at the University of Wisconsin. Um, again, the same kind of thing. The idea is that we're gonna tell you, now, we're gonna tell you as much as we can. And um, sometimes things don't go the way we think. And it's not, anything intentional. Um, we, we try, again, the first line of the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. And so that's why we need those cells in culture. We need those cells because we can do it in a, in a little tissue, I should have brought one with me, a little box of cells rather than infecting a whole person. Um, you know, everything, we, going to another virus, everything we know about HIV, pretty much happened from studying patients or studying how that virus worked in cells. In the early days of, of HIV and AIDS, how many people said, oh, that's no problem, you can inject me with the virus. <laughs> yeah, that's where those cells come into play. That's why they're so important. Because the more we can find out about the various viruses or bacterial infections or whatever, the better good we can do. And we try to tell you, but again, back in 1951, they didn't understand what they were working with. They didn't have a clue that those, those cells were infected with a virus. And being at a medical institution, especially, how do I say this delicately? Especially being at Hopkins, um, and it's not just Hopkins, it's the Johns Hopkins University Hospital. Um, <laughs> 
they were all about research. They were all about doing good. Um, like she said, the big names in, in OBGYN are there. Um, but any of you decided to go to medical school, the big names in surgery were there. The big name, they were the medical research institution in this country for the early, for probably most of the, however, since whenever it was established, and I have no idea when that was. 1889. Huh? 1889. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 1889, huh? Let's see. So I was there years later. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's all about research and making people better. Ideally, if we can make this patient better, wonderful. But can we inhibit these horrible diseases that are most often the ones that they see at Hopkins? She would, like you said, she was very lucky that she was, lived in Baltimore. Or, excuse me, it's Balmer. Um, <laughs> that she got that treatment, that, she, that they even saw her, you know. Other places, if, if she'd have lived where she was born, she'd have just died a horrible death period. They would, she never would have known. And all the science that happened from those cells never would have happened. <coughs> and I don't even want to think about what that would have meant for the rest of us. So. Something about the ethics of, you know, no longer if your cells, I mean, if, if today there was another Henrietta Lacks, you wouldn't use the person's name. Right. And in a way, I'm thinking of it on, I'm thinking of it, you know, like you think now we have HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which pr protects all our privacy. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it was a gift to her family that they did use her name, that, sh that she did in some Well, they some did and they didn't. Yeah, tell me, what, what do you think? Well, you know, they didn't, they're not Henry well, and Alaska. they used the wrong name yeah. for a while and things like that. In the, in the beginning, probably, yeah, because it was their way of, you know, nomenclature has, <laughs> has changed, but cell lines, it's always, um, you're never quite sure where the name comes from. It's kind of nice with her that we know where the, her cells right. come. But there are, you know, some cells we know exactly what they are. Um, cells that are used a lot now before, in some cases, are Cho cells. Cho is Chinese hamster ovary cells. Mm -hmm. I used a cell line called Vero. I have no idea where Vero comes from because they're African green monkey cell, kidney cells. Huh. Um, you know, and sometimes it was the name of, put the name of the researcher in, which I think is a little, you know, whatever. And, you know, so there's never been a, a real, okay, if you have a cell line, this is how you name it to this day. And so at the time, it was a patient. They you used know, the first two. They just mm -hmm. used her name. And it, w and it wasn't until Hopkins that I first heard Henrietta Lacks. Before that, it was Helen Lane or Helen Lake, or we're not sure exactly what her name is. We just knew. Hattie Lamar. Huh? Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar. 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 Yeah. yeah. It's Hedley. Um, you know, so um, who knows? Yeah, there were all kinds of things um, told of, of what Gila st stood for. And it wasn't until I got to Hopkins that they fully recognized her name and what she did. No <laughs> way Let, let's continue on the theme of the way things were. And, and let's talk about patients seeking treatment and the trends that have been sort of identified in medicine, some people seem to go to the doctor more than others, and it continues to this day. Um, the term that, that is used is, is the trust gap, that there is a, a definable, describable gap between certain cultures in the United States and, and elsewhere, but we'll focus on the U.S. for now, and physicians, a, a gap of trust. And, and for purposes of this book, we'll use the African-American community. Not a lot of people in 1951 seem to go to the doctor, and there are reasons for that, some of which are not economic. So let's talk a little bit then, maybe the, the medical practitioners can, can start with this. Let's talk a little bit about how medicine attempts to bring patients in for treatment. Is there something that we can do to make sure that people who need care get it? So uh, this is something that 
really stood out to me in this book as a medical practitioner. This may have been written in 19, or what took place in the 1950s, but this is absolutely relevant today. Um, the women who are still dying from cervical cancer today, even though we've made all these strides and have decreased our numbers and our um, prognosis, or improved our prognosis for this, the women who are still dying are predominantly minority women, women who do not have the resources to access care or who may have other things in their lives that prevent them from taking a day off work to go access care because they have so many other things and so many other people that rely on them to care for them. And so um, I work uh, occasionally through our Cook County Hospital, Stroger Hospital, which is where ER took place or where it fil was filmed. And this is really a catch-all place for um, men and women throughout the uh, Chicagoland area to gain care when they didn't have health insurance. And the things that you see there, it's like you're working in a third, third world country where there's absolutely no access to health care. And this is happening in a major metropolitan city in the U.S. And so lack of health insurance, as you said, is obviously a huge issue. But there are other things. A lot of these communities are very, very close-knit. And um, we reference the African-American community from this book, but at the same time, this is relevant to other minority communities, too. Many of them um, access anecdotal medicine, medicine more so than evidence-based medicine. So they mm -hmm. heard that their sister had some procedure or had something happen to them, and so they kind of ignore or delay um, going to the doctor, or they don't trust the way the doctor um, or other healthcare professional manage one of their family members so they don't go to the doctor. And so this is brought up again in the book when um, the author goes to interview Henrietta's family and Day comes walking out with his gangrenous toes, but he doesn't want to go have surgery because he doesn't want people cutting on him like they did on Henrietta. Mm -hmm. And so this is absolutely relevant. And part of it goes along with um, the way that we've engaged uh, minorities in this country, both in education but also in healthcare, and the way that we've set up our health insurance system in this country. And so I would like to think that it's going to get better um, because of the Affordable Care Act and because of more um, men and women being able to access health care over the next few years uh, and gain access to care much earlier so they can be diagnosed and cured. But um, there is still this trust gap that remains where we as a healthcare community need to re reach out. We need to find ways to not only educate um, different communities on health risks, but also on preventive me measures. We need to gain trust. We need to get over some of these issues like Gila and Tuskegee where we took advantage of these communities. And yes, we had great gains from this as a society. And some of these people in these communities are, are benefiting from this, but at the same time, they don't forget that we took advantage of them in order to gain this information. And so we need to show that we are partnering with them, that we are educating them, and that we, they are given an active role in their treatment and care so that they can trust us and come back to us and gain the care much earlier than showing up at the end. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about Hopkins it's, uh, and Ho the Hopkins Hospital. Um, it's kind of Johns Hopkins is basically really two campuses, sort of like KU. Um, there's KU University out in Lawrence, you know, college town, whatever. Well, in Baltimore, the Homewood campus, which is the undergraduate campus, um, is in a very, very nice part of Baltimore. Um, beautiful homes. Um, if you see any of those movies about the old, um, colleges with the lawns landscaped and the big trees and, and happy, happy, that's Homewood campus. The medical campus, on the other hand, which is, includes the medical school, the School of Public Health, which is actually where I got my PhD from, and the hospital was in the less affluent part of town, shall we say, um, which actually be, pretty much became the slums. Um, when I was there many years ago, and actually I was there kind of the same distance after Henrietta as I, we are from now, so I was kind of there right in the middle of the time. Um, you know, there were a lot of abandoned homes. It wasn't a safe place to be. Um, when we had a park, for instance, um, several blocks away because they were building a new parking structure or something, they had a bus to take us three blocks because it wasn't safe for us to walk, okay? Does this give you kind of the 
idea of the neighborhood that, that Hopkins um, Hospital um, lived in at the time. 1951, they weren't African Americans, they weren't blacks, they were colored people, okay? Um, and they were primarily, um, you know, the, the maids for the people that lived around Homewood. They were the, oh, the maids in the hotels, they were the cooks, they were, you know, so yeah, there, there was that, there was Hopkins Hospital, but the, some of the poorest people in Baltimore lived around that hospital, which gave them a, a, an advantage to being able to access care easily if they wanted to. But again, they had those stories in their culture of, you know, Aunt, Aunt May went to the hospital and never came out again. Mm -hmm. And um, also a very, fairly low um, education rate there. Um, and Hopkins has done wonderful things in that neighborhood to, to um, try to elevate that neighborhood and, and pay back that neighborhood. Um, but again, in 1951, how many of you have seen the, the hairspray? That was Baltimore in 1961, kind of. But you still saw that there was a split between whites and, and African Americans. You know, 51, it was worse. So, you know, we have to realize it's not today. And um, I'm sure Dr. Gay probably didn't Dr. Gay saw cancer. He didn't see the patient as far as being black or white or, or purple for that matter. But we have to realize that, again, he was, he was a man of medicine and, and curing people and doing stuff for the better good was always in his, in his thoughts. I know one of his contemporaries um, when I was at Hopkins, one of um, Dr. Gay's contemporaries was John Hanks, who has um, actually a, one of the solutions we use is Hanks Balanced Salt Solution um, that we use in tissue culture. So they interacted one another. And he was the most wonderful man. And I can't imagine, um, and maybe it's my, my belief that every researcher, well, not every researcher, most of them are good. I can't, I still don't fathom the whole. Do you know what the Tuskegee, we keep talking about the Tuskegee experiment was? You know about that? Okay. That went on until 1972. 40 years. Yeah. 40 years of 40. allowing people to expire from syphilis. So we try to be good, we try to do good, but, and I'm sure those researchers thought they were doing good too. We had to understand syphilis. Because syphilis is, one, is caused by a bacteria, and it's one of the few bacteria we aren't able to grow in culture and in art, under artificial conditions in the lab. And so I'm sure they thought, well, we can't study it in the lab. We've got to study it mm -hmm. in the only test tube we have, which is a human being, unfortunately. Maybe to speak to you know, the now, <laughs> and, and maybe as a backdrop, a lot of what was, was said, I mean, and what guides the medical profession, what guides the legal profession, what guides the educational pr pr um, profession, um, hopefully ethics, and hopefully you know, codes of conduct that um, <coughs> members of those respective communities have established are the best practice for those particular um, professions. But policies as well, and laws, but you phrased your question in absence of law, and um, as I always, Oh, um, in absence of laws, and, and hopefully laws are informed by eth ethics and science um, to the extent um, that is, uh, science is available. Um, those are the kinds of forces that impact, um, hopefully, any law, regulation, or uh, force in, in, in professional context. But, uh, context, excuse me. Um, but the now, as it relates to human subject research, and I think um, a couple of people touched on this, that the year of interest is 1974. Um, and, and that was a year in which, you know, in terms of federal, the, the Federal Research Act and, and implementing and instituting IRB uh, boards in federally funded research agencies and um, educational institutions. It was at that point you really had uh, in force uh, expectations for procedures that had to be in play uh, in order to conduct research that involved human subjects. and. Um, at looking back, we can say we've come a long way again, and we've come um, a long way in a good way, uh, although occasionally you hear of some 
abuses even to those systems, and things fall through the cracks. And so it's, it's constantly a matter of, of evolving and revising and, and, and looking at, as time marches on, uh, what challenges you have and what revisions to policies need to be had. And uh, in my earlier lecture, and I think that's available to all of you, I trace the history of the regulatory aspects of human subject research. And there's a lot of slides that talk about things like the Nuremberg Code and Belmont Report and the um, National Research Act. And there's even a, a slide that, that itemizes what's expected in terms of institutional research board reviews and informed consent. And so the tricky part of informed consent is either of the words, <laughs> inform and consent. Can you truly give consent to something that you're not fully informed about? And so whether it's Tuskegee or Henry Lack situation, I mean, we can look at the past and say that informed consent, or at least consent, was absent because of information available or no one was ever asked um, how certain uh, practices should proceed. But today, we can't do that. We can't do that easily. What happens, unfortunately, though, is in the information um, piece of it, um, the, the question is, can you really distill down into a conversation to a patient who may be stressed or in pain or, you know, under a lot of um, other pressures in their lives, can they truly understand um, in the way that a physician or a lawyer, whoever's in the conversation, uh, can they distill down into a conversation years and years of training and practice to a patient who's, who's stressed uh, what the options are and have true consent uh, in return. In a 15 minute visit. In a 15 minute <laughs> visit, uh, or less in some cases. And so that's kind of where we're at. Informed consent seems to be a good idea. We all, you know, on, on the surface think it's, it's great. We, we see what happens in absence of it. Um, however, there's still problems. And that triggers a whole lot of uh, practical questions, but certainly it triggers a whole lot of ethical questions about whether we're really even achieving that. There was also a comment about diminished capacity, and that's something that we have made a lot of <laughs> good um, strides in, that when individuals that we can um, assess are not competent legally is the word, uh, then we take even um, added more stringent precautions to ensure that we're acting in their best interests. And so it's a heightened level of, of regard for what that individual may want should they have, have, had, have ever been in a position where they could give uh, consent. So. That's where we are now, in, in the backdrop of where we were, that, that, that really, in many respects, brought us to this place. It's much better than it was in the past. OK, very good. What I'd like to do now, since we only have about 15 minutes left, is uh, open it up to questions from the audience. Is there anyone who would like to ask our panel something? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Dr. Garland. The question is, uh, when Henrietta was pregnant, did her cancer, or I'm sorry, did the pregnancy make the cancer worse? It's hard to say. Um, unfortunately, because she'd already had some symptoms even before pregnancy, and then was followed with attention paid to her pregnancy, ignoring the other symptoms that she may have had, both herself and potentially her care providers, she probably lost time. She may have been diagnosed earlier, but in the end, it probably wouldn't have made much of a difference for her because of her poor prognosis with this type of cancer. Um, we do often diagnose uh, cervical cancer during pregnancy for a couple of reasons. Sometimes it's because it's the only time that women access care, and so they're coming in, I'm doing a pap smear on them because they're pregnant, and I actually have them in my office for the first time in five years. And so often we um, identify abnormalities of the cervix and sometimes aggressive cervical cancer. We think that the pregnancy can potentially um, affect their overall prognosis, but it's not usually by a lot. It's mostly what the cancer type is and how advanced it is at the time it's diagnosed. What, what do you do? Well, the question is, what can you do when you have a patient who is pregnant with cancer? So it depends when it's diagnosed. If it's diagnosed very early in pregnancy and we know that um, it is more advanced and she needs treatment, we give her the option of pregnancy termination and moving forward with uh, a hysterectomy, chemo, radiation. If it's diagnosed later in pregnancy when the fetus is going to be viable, then we often will um, wait until the fetus is going to do well enough but still be preterm 
and deliver the baby, do a hysterectomy at that point, and mm -hmm. then she moves forward with chemo and radiation. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. One of the ethical issues uh, exercised in the book is that uh, Henrietta's cells were taken before her death, mm -hmm. and there seems to be a, a, a little legal or ethical barrier that separates taking cells while the patient is alive versus in autopsy after the patient's uh, device. Is that still an ethical barrier, and if so, what, how does it complicate your it, it's not a legal barrier. <laughs> I can, we, we had this discussion kind of informally in the hallway before the, um, the, the talk, uh, the presentation. And in order for there to be a violation or a, a tort, a, um, you know, an, an injury, if you will, to a client, um, you have to prove duty, breach, causation, and injury. And so you walk through this rubric of considerations and, you know, is there a duty? Is there um, an expectation of a certain kind of... Um, of, of practice, uh, patient, client, lawyer, physician, those kinds of relationships are well worked out. If you can start establish a duty, then you could get to the next level, which is, um, is there a breach? And so when you can show that there's a breach, um, is there injury? And then of course you can get into an assessment as to what the remedies or what the um, restoration uh, to the pre-injured state might be legally. Um, in this case, to, to conclude that there was an injury to Henrietta, before or after death would entail that she has a property interest in her medical waste, if you will. Um, if it's part of, like we talked about, a lot of it depends on time. I mean, if she was not informed and there wasn't such a thing as informed consent and it was within ordinary practice to um, kind of do exploratory types of things medically in order to, to diagnose and, and maybe inform the, the uh, treatment of a disease, then nothing wrong there in terms of duty, or you can't imply that there's a breach. And so, there's you know, how do you remedy a wrong that doesn't? You can't prove that there's a wrong. So prior to death, doing what was done to her at the time, um, you would say legally. And I would think, I mean, ethically, it gets a little more tricky because ethics is usually we're looking at, particularly in a um, deontological way, a Kantian way, we're looking at treating the individuals with respect. And so you could say that the individual, a rash, is treating an individual as a end not as a means only, uh, you would say um, you, that would imply that there should have been a conversation. Um, it, there wasn't any expectation legally or medically or otherwise that that conversation had to be had, but still you can make an ethical argument it should have been had. Um, again, getting back to so what that it didn't happen, the, that's the part that I think we struggle the most with um, in hindsight, is the conversation didn't happen so she, didn't, she wasn't fully informed, and then what was done with the fruits of the research after the fact seems like, feels like, um, there was some wrong done to her or her survivors, but that's the part where it all falls apart because <laughs> there was never really any ownership in those materials. Um, it was in a medical sense, again, I, the analogy I used to use was, I mean, if you go to a dentist and um, you have teeth pulled, maybe you save your wisdom teeth because it's, you know, a souvenir of some type. That aside, when you go into a medical procedure, how many people go to these offices and leave with their bodily fluids and their, <laughs> their tissue? I mean, that's not something that happens, nor is there any expectation of that. There's some public health problems with that. <laughs> and so there's a lot of reasons why that practice doesn't happen. So then to say in hindsight, because physicians took those materials that would have ordinarily been disposed of and did research and turned that into something that happened to lead to patents and lead to um, sort of a lucrative and um, is somehow a wrong to Henrietta or her survivors is, is a stretch. Um, well, and they had to take it when she was alive. If the cells wouldn't have been used. If they, if, <laughs> it's, a bio, it's pretty simple. Um, mm. you know, if they wanted to try to put this, these cells into culture, they had to be alive. Taking them at autopsy, they were dead. <laughs> so it would never have worked. And again, you, again, at the time, have you ever done anything where you've tried and tried and tried and tried and every time you've tried it was a failure and then suddenly you do it with something slightly, you change one thing and it works? That's what the, what the life of someone who was trying to do cell culture was. You know, he, he found a cell that 
grew in culture that worked. Didn't know why, didn't know how, didn't necessarily behave like any other cells they had ever looked at, but they lived. And um, it's a very, very difficult process to take, to take cells from, from the original whatever um, and get them to grow in culture for a little while, much less the fact, and now we know that those cells, be, being cancer cells, were immortal, which is the terminology we use, and you know, getting them to grow and, and to be able to use them for anything. Um, you know, just to give you again a, a, a feeling, what the feeling of medical research and, and good, I go back to my polio vaccine thing. In 1955, um, after they had made all the killed polio vaccines um, that Dr. Salk oversaw, um, they vaccinated all school children for free. Unfortunately, one company didn't follow the protocol exactly correctly, and the vaccine that that particular company made wasn't killed, it was live, and so they gave polio to some people. There was never a lawsuit. There was never a, oh, we're gonna, you know, whatever. <coughs> the company went out of business. <laughs> but it was for the greater good. They understood at that time polio was such a scary disease and so such a devastating disease that they would rather take the risk than not. And so, you know, it, in our litigious society today, would that ever happen again? Mm, no. <laughs> so the a whole thought about medicine and medical research and treatments and entirely different in the 60 years between then and now. So, you know, we can talk a good, oh, well, we would do this and that, but we weren't there. And unless we were there, it's really tough to say what, what happened then and how it would affect what happens, you know, if it was the same situation. Dr. Reinhardt. I have a question. Mm. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, uh, why are HeLa cells so powerful? Why do they replicate so well? Probably because of the fact they're infected with HPV. And, and I'm not sure exactly how, um, but with the HPV, when, when its DNA goes into that, went into her, her DNA, it changed that cell and turned on things that made that cell replicate more because those, and there are multiple viruses, I think, in those cells, it said. And that means that in order for viruses to grow, the cell has to grow. And so if I'm a virus and I infect a cell, to be totally successful, I want to make that cell grow as well as that cell can grow, right? And so there's something about the HPV infection in her cells um, that, that amped up the replication of that cell. And we know that with, with a lot of primary cells that go into cell lines that, that we put into culture, that primary means the cells that we've just taken from a body, an organ, blood, whatever, um, when they go into culture and are su successful in culture, excuse me, they've undergone some kind of change where it, we call it transformation, where they've almost become like cancer cells. Mm -hmm. And they lose a lot of the controls that our normal cells have. 
our normal cells, when they butt up against each other, they stop growing, okay? Um, cells in culture, cancer cells, they just keep growing. They, they, they lost that ability to, to know when to stop. Um, and they, there are a lot of other things like that. And so her cells being that highly aggressive cancer, because of all the HPV that was inside of them, yeah, he got lucky. And that's what a lot of scientific research and, and things are. We got lucky. Penicillin. Penicillin, Luck. yeah. Yeah, if, 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 you're, if you're like me, um, you read this book and you want to take microbiology because <laughs> there's just so, there. so much to know. I have a couple of questions up here, and I'm going to bring the mic to you. My degree is in is in infectious diseases, so <laughs> I'm there for you. Um, my question is to you over here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Um, Fine. Earlier year, you talked about how you thought that um, Henrietta's name being attached to the cells was a gift. I was wondering if you just expand on that, what you mean by that, because, Thank you. you know, in a way, it could be taken kind Thank of in a wrong way. Right. Thank you for the um, question. I guess because I feel, and, I, and I'm glad you asked it, because I, when I read this book, and I also heard Rebecca speak, and especially reading her book, you really get a sense that because she knew who this was and could actually find her family, she was able to do so much good. And what I mean by that is the good of helping them heal from tremendous sadness, pain, confusion. They had no, as you know, they had no idea what happened. They thought that their mother was alive and that she was being cloned like you know sheep and things like that. They had so many misconceptions that because she was able to find them, and they had so much tragedy. They lost their mother. They had so much abuse, you know, especially the boys. And um, the, the part of the book that really touched my heart was when that wonderful physician or scientist made that photo of her cells that we see here. And, and he did that on his own. I mean, talk about doing good in the world. If you talk about ethics and wanting to do good, whether you're a physician, nurse, or a lay person, just wanting to do good. And he realized that he wanted to say thank you. And he wanted to say thank you to her offspring. And if you remember when she, Deborah, the daughter, gave that print off to the son, Zachariah, his tears and his, his looking at that, like, that's like, it's my mother, you know, this is my mother. That's, that's why. I think it was, it, on one hand, you could say, oh my gosh, you know, the, her identity wasn't protected. But then on the other hand, all the good that was done for that family to heal from all that sadness. Thank you for asking. Thank you. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so my first question, or my question first goes to uh, right here. So you were saying how this couldn't, this wouldn't happen again, and I didn't say it wouldn't happen again. Well, the likelihood of it happening again was less like. Well, it, it would, it would, the whole process could happen again, but again, because of our, our informed consent and, and all of those things today, um, it, would, it would be different. It could still, um, you know, the whole process of, of, and it still happens, you know, probably a lot when they take cells from patients and, and utilize them in research. I mean, that's what, uh, what medical research is. That's a lot of what KU or, or KU Med or other um, medical uh, research institutions do. That's why they're there, because they want to do research with samples from patients, whatever it might be. Now, today they have to, as part of, the, as part of their grant from NIH or wherever, they have to tell the patient what they're doing with that sample. Now that can take a lot of, and, and you know, we have a high degree, I shouldn't go on that soapbox, a high degree of scientific illiteracy in our country. And I think that too, um, interprets how you read this book, how much science you know versus how much science you don't know. And so it's up to the researcher to explain, like she said, as best you can, well, 
hopefully in more than a 15 minute doctor's visit. <laughs> um, but the, the whole process can still happen. It'll just be a different process and we probably won't name the cells after you. Okay, so I was thinking about some uh, research that I had done on the Tuskegee uh, University and the syphilis that was um, the, the syphilis that was given to people, um, like 600 people over the course of 40 years, and it wasn't until 1972 that it, a whistleblower uh, made it to, aware to the public. And then it wasn't until 1997 that President Clinton acknowledged it and gave, Reparations. Uh, gave, a, gave an, apo a, a, an official apology to all of the people who were involved. Mm -hmm. At that time, only seven people were alive. Mm -hmm. And so should it take 25 more years from the time that the um, that this was made public no. from t 25 and advancing 25 years should it take that long to get the appropriate recognition for the family members no it shouldn't it shouldn't have and that you, you have raised a very important point the fact that it took that long would make people of that culture, the African-American culture, um, less trusting of American medicine, particularly um, you know, white providers. And I see that that still is, is, a, is an issue. And there's a good reason that it's still an issue. And we have to work harder to gain their trust in many situations. Done good research. We are out of time, unfortunately. But um, I'd like to thank our panelists. And would you join me, please, in a round of applause? Thank you all. Thank you all for coming.